really good to be here today. Um, as Margaret said, there are a lot of families that are going through this issue of the transfer of non-titled personal property. And we at Extension, at Iowa State Extension, have been doing this program now for about two and a half, um, almost three years. And the people that go through the program um, have, I think, been really, really um, taken with all the things that they are starting to think about. Um, we get all kinds of stories from people, the good stories and the not so good stories about what happens in families with respect to this. So, so there's a lot of emotion attached to this, which is why we're doing the program. What we want is to get families to talk to one another and to communicate before the crisis occurs. So I want to start by just making um, a few quick uh, comments. Uh, there we go. A few quick comments um, that we all need to start with, and that's that everyone, no matter what your financial status, everyone has property to transfer. Now, some people say to me, Jan, nobody is going to want my junk, right? Nobody's going to want my stuff. But when you think about it, there are a lot of stories attached with these things. And we have things in our homes and things that have been in our family's homes for many years. Sometimes they don't have a lot of financial value, but they have a lot of sentimental value. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and the reason we're going to talk about this is that adult siblings have been known to break off relationships with each other over how property has been transferred. And that's what we want to try to avoid. We want to try to avoid the, the, the bad things and try to get families again to talk to one another about this issue. Now, I want to stress, too, what we're not talking about today. We're not talking about titled property. We're not talking about things such as uh, real estate, savings and checking accounts, cars, machinery, stocks and bonds. Those things are easy. We know where they're going to go. What we're talking about are the non-titled items. Um, old guns that have been in the family for years, tools, furniture, old photographs, books, Bibles, printed items. Um, old dishes, linens. How many of you collect things besides dust? How do you okay, what do you collect? Music. Music? Okay. What about you? Christmas, dolls, Okay. Okay. You have a big house? <laughs> a lot of collections. Okay. What, what do you collect? Anything? You know, me? Mm hmm. Uh, well, I have a number of books. That may be okay. Books? Okay. Anybody else? I just have old things. I live in an old farmhouse, so. Oh. I have old things. In an old farmhouse, you collect a lot of old things. Great. Actually, it's the, it's the farmhouse that my grandparents came to in 1965. Really? So there's some things from that uh, previous generation? Yeah, a few things. Good. Some things have already been apportioned. Uh huh. <laughs> Wonderful. Anybody else collect anything? I collect postcards. Postcards. Good. That's not much to, to worry about in oh, space, oh, oh. but. <laughs> what about you? What do you collect? Anything? Oh, mm -hmm. well, books. Stamps. Well, yeah. stamps. stamps and books? I've got my mother's stamp collection. Your mother's stamp collection. Okay. Um, I have a challenge for you today. For the next 45 minutes, or whenever Margaret says I need to stop, I want you to, I want to, I want to give you a challenge. I want you to promise me that when we think about this issue of the transfer of non-titled personal property, that you don't make assumptions. Okay? Now think about that. When you think about how we're going to do this, what's the first thing that you want to do? You want to make a list, right? Everybody wants to make a list of who's going to get this and who's going to get that. Now, we just talked about collections, and I'm going to tell you what I collect. And I'm going to tell you because you'll never guess. I collect old buck saws. Now, why are you laughing? <laughs> I don't know why people laugh. <laughs> it's like a saw that, you know, it has a, a big, okay. it's like some, sort of like that. Anyway, I collect buck saws, and would my grandfather have given me a buck saw if he didn't know I collected them? Would he have given me one? No, why? Because I'm female, right? And a lot of times we make assumptions about what we think other people are going to want. So what I want you to do, again, is to not make assumptions. And when you think about the transfer of non-titled personal property, one of the things that we need to do that we don't think about too often is asking people if they want it. Now think about those collections that you just talked about. Who's going to get them? Have you decided who's going to get them? Anybody? No? 
What do you would some of them? Have you asked them if they want them? No. Nope. <laughs> see, see again. Here's what we do. We tend to we tend to say, okay, this you know Johnny's going to get the tools and Susie's going to get the quilts, and we make these assumptions that they're going to want it. I had a woman in a workshop say to me, Jan, how can I make sure that the person that I give this to is going to keep it? And what's the answer? You can't. you can't. Exactly. And here's a story from my family. I was very fortunate. Um, I had two grandmothers who made quilts. And they're gorgeous, and I have several of them. But I remember one Christmas, Grandma Davis gave all the women in the family a quilt. All the daughters, the daughters-in-law, the granddaughters, the granddaughters-in-law. We all got a quilt that year. She'd been working on them for a long time. And I found out about three summers ago that my sister-in-law had a garage sale. She did. She sold my grandma's quilt. Now, it's helped for me to do these workshops because I've told like three, you know, probably 1,500 to 2,000 people about this, which, which helps me deal with it. But I was really angry when I heard about that. But I remember in, a, in one of the first workshops I did um, on this Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pipe Light, one of the first workshops, um, we brought up this issue of how do you make sure that someone keeps what you give them? And a woman in the front row raised her hand, and she said, Jan, a gift is a gift, no strings attached, right? And sometimes we got to let that stuff go, because what's most important here? The relationships, right? The relationships with the people. And so sometimes we do have to let those things go, but if we go back to not making assumptions and asking people if they really want some of these things, they're a lot more likely to keep them. And in the process, you can talk to them about the, the stories behind these items, where they came from. 1865, right? That farmhouse has been in your family since 1865. There are a lot of stories there. There's, a, there's an awful lot of stories there. So what we want to do, again, is to get families to communicate with one another. Now, this program, Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate, was really developed by Minnesota Extension. And they developed this program based upon research done on 64 families in northwest and southwest uh, Minnesota. And what they found in this research that there are a lot of unique challenges associated with non-titled personal property transfer. They found that sentimental meanings make decisions very emotionally charged. And we're finding that out <laughs> uh, very clearly. They also found that personal belongings have different value and meaning to each individual. My brother doesn't want my buck saws, neither does my sister. Okay? There's a lot of, you, you, have, to, you have to think that, that these things have different value and meaning. It's also d very difficult to measure the worth or the value. How can you possibly put a price on grandma's quilt? How can you put a price on that? In, it's also impossible to divide items equally. Does equal always mean fair? No, because the, you've got a lot of variables involved. Sometimes there's caregiving issues, right? Um, so there's, there's, it's very difficult to divide in, uh, items equally. And on top of all these challenges, we've got the process of grieving and saying goodbye to people that we really love. So you've got to think about that challenge as well. Then there's ownership issues. Who owns that round oak table in the, in the, in the living room that came over three generations ago? Who really owns that? You because it's in your house or the family? as a unit. So sometimes there's ownership issues involved here. And then who's family? When you go through the distribution process, do you include the, the grandchildren, the aunts and uncles, the cousins? And what's the answer to that? The answer is it depends on your family, right? And that's why you need to talk to one another to decide who's going to go through that process with you. And then finally, another challenge is that distribution methods and consequences become a lot less clear with non-titled personal property. Okay, we're going to talk about different distribution methods in a little bit. So again, what Minnesota Extension found was that we need to consider certain factors. We need to recognize the sensitivity of this issue. We need to determine what we want to accomplish in the transfer. And I'm going to talk about goals in just a second. We want to decide what's fair in the context of your family, which might be different than someone else's family. We want to understand that belongings have different meanings to different individuals, consider different distribution options, and also agree to manage conflicts, not if they arise, when they arise, right? Because they are going to arise. And what we're finding is that sometimes those conflicts can provide an opportunity for people to talk about certain things. 
to talk about the good, good times and the not so good times and, and what really is important in that family. Now, with respect to the sensitivity of the issue, um, again, research found that issues of inheritance are discussed among family members at various family gatherings, during daily activities. Now, here's a question for you. During what daily activity is this issue addressed most? What do you think? At the dinner table, you're close. During what daily activity? Dishwashing. Exactly. I love this. Research found that this issue of non-titled personal property is discussed most when women are doing dishes. Now, this is a little less prevalent because of dishwashers. But you got to load them, right? You still got to load the dishwasher. And I remember when I was real little, and I would, I loved holiday dinners. You know, the, the, the Thanksgiving and the, 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 the Christmas and, and uh, um, Easter dinner. Because I would, after we ate, go into the kitchen, and I would listen to the women talk. I don't know what I was doing. I was pretending to dry dishes, whatever it was. But there was some really good discussions going on after those <laughs> holiday meals. And if you think about it, that's when you can hear the juicy stuff. That's when you can hear the good stuff. Again, who brings up the issue? Females from older generations. Um, and, and two, remember, inheritance issues are sensitive, sensitive and challenging because we're facing our own or somebody else's mortality, and we don't like to do that. That's not a pleasant thing. Also, we need, there's, a, there's a fear of how motives may be interpreted. I was sitting in mom's living room, or dining room, not too long ago. And I said, gee, mom, I really like that mirror on the wall. It's an old mirror from, I don't know, a couple generations ago. And she said, you can't wait till I die, can you, Jan? <laughs> and she was joking, because she knows I do, I do this program. But you, know, you have to be careful of how you bring this up. And it wasn't too long after that, we were sitting in the same dining room. And I said, you know, with this twinkle in my eye. Who's going to get that round glass china closet in the corner there? And she smiled and she said, well, you know, Susan, my sister really wants one. But she said she's going to go out and buy one. And without thinking, I said, can't she wait? <laughs> and, and as soon as I said it, I realized, you know, that was kind of a dumb thing to say. And she laughed. She was in a good mood that day, too. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to be careful about how you bring some of these, these issues up. So, uh, so, rec so just remember uh, that fear of of how motives may be interpreted. And I hear a lot of families say that the kids don't want to talk about this issue, right? The parents can't get the kids to talk about it, or vice versa. So it's kind of interesting. Also, you need to expect conflict or disagreement. And if you expect it and you plan for it in advance, then you're a li lot likely to, to head it off at the pass. And we're going to talk about some ways to do that. And then again, uh, regarding the sensitivity, we've got that grief and loss process over all of this which makes it especially difficult. Um, we have to remember, too, that a lot of these items that we've talked about, even the collections, they are just objects. Okay, They're not people. But these objects provide continuity in our life and across generations. And I remember, again, when I was real little, I, I used to go stay with Aunt Annie. And I remember Aunt Annie's living room. And there was this beautiful old wooden radio in that living room. And I wish I had that radio now, but I don't. But that's not what I remember most. What I remember is the little dog on that radio with a head that wagged. And I was fascinated by this dumb little dog that had no financial value. But it was a dog with a head that wagged. And when I think about that dog with a head that wagged, I, th I think of Aunt Annie. I can smell her house. I can see the woodwork in there. I can, I can turn the corner and see the dining room. And I think it's those objects, those objects that provide that continuity. And then we can share some of those stories. So we need to remember that, yes, they are just things. But those things can, can provide the triggers that we use to remember certain things. Now, I mentioned earlier that we want to think about goals. And remember, what a lot of people do is when they talk about this issue, they want to go out and write a list, right? They want to make a list of who's going to get what. Well, I would challenge you to think about the goals first. Now, you need to think about what would, might be a goal in your family. For example, your family might want to work on preserving memories. Maybe that's really important for your family. Another goal may be to improve family, family relationships that are a tad bit rocky right now, OK? Another goal may be to maintain privacy. And by that I mean have a private auction with the family rather than a public estate auction. 
And there's a, um, a good example of that. When my, both my grandparents passed away, my mom and her siblings got together in grandma's house. But their first rule, no siblings. Or, I mean, sorry, no spouses. No spouses, just the four of them. And that was important because they, they wanted to not only maintain the privacy, but they wanted to improve family relationships, which are, you know, not all that great sometimes. Um, so it was important that they did that. But they also, before I forget to tell you, they also developed some other rules. They drew numbers. There were four of them. One, two, three, and four. Okay? So then number one chose something first, then number two, then number three, then number four, then number four, then number three, then number two, one. And I've heard a derivation of that. You can do one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, three, four, one, two, four, one, two, three. But you set those rules ahead of time. You also decide what are you going to do if two or more people want the same thing. And you want to talk about what you're going to do about that before you start choosing. Okay? And if everybody agrees to that method, then there's a lot less um, likelihood of disagreement. But that's, that's part of maintaining the privacy. Again, maybe not having the, the public estate auction, but having a private estate auction. Another uh, goal may be to be fair to everybody involved. Okay, and to fair again, we talked about that. Fair does not always mean equal. And sometimes you've got siblings who live even farther away that may do more than the siblings who live closer. It just depends on the family situation there. So you need to consider all that. And another goal may be to contribute to society. And by that I mean maybe you've got a really neat heirloom in your family. And um, either there is really no one real close to give it to, or you want to contribute that to the historical society or to a, a local museum. So you may want to think about that as a goal in your family too. And what I would recommend is that you think about a couple or, or three different goals and think about that before you start to make the list. Okay. Now I have a, I have a question for you. What is your yellow pie plate? Okay. I have a yellow pie plate here. This was actually spray painted by a county director um, who knows that I do this program quite a bit. And he also knows that I, uh, graduate from the, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin. So he put the cyclone in here to remi remind me of who I work for, which was very, very nice of him to do that. But what I want you to do is think about what is your yellow pie plate. Mine is my grandma's quilts. Okay. What is your yellow pie plate? Anybody? Do you have a yellow pie plate? Do you have a yellow pie plate? <laughs> no yellow pie plate yet? You will. Margaret, what's your yellow pie plate? <laughs> uh, right now, it would be my mother. I got my mother's wedding ring. So oh. That's real special to me. Your mother's wedding ring. Wow. What's going to happen to that, Margaret? Well, fortunately, there are two diamonds. Um, my real father had died when I was a baby, so when my mother remarried, she took the diamond that he gave her, and then my father uh, gave a got her a diamond, they put the two together, and fortunately I only have two daughters, and so I've already told them <laughs> that, uh, and it's all written down that they will each get one. Great. But I, it, that was the only thing I wanted from my mother, and I was mm -hmm. fortunate to get it. Great. So that you expect a little conflict in that situation? I don't, because I've talked to both my daughters. The communication and, has, and has happened. Yeah, the Great. The oldest said, oh, the older can have it, and I said, no, there are two diamonds, and each of you, and mm -hmm. I've written it already down. Wonderful. So it's all taken care of. What, what, what about some of the rest of you? What is your yellow pie plate? Well, I have, a, I have a group of plates that belong to my parents. Some were wedding gifts. One was a little plate that my father ate. It was his little uh, child. When he was a child, he ate off that plate, and you still have it. What's going to happen to that? Well, I have several of them. And my problem is I don't know which of my children will want anything. Okay, she doesn't know which of her children are going to want anything. What do you suggest she does? Not. She do. They may not want anything. They all have, you know. So I'm thinking it's my grandchildren who are going to want things. My own children have all kinds of stuff. Okay. Have you asked your children if they might want those things? No, but I, I can imagine what they might say. <laughs> you might be surprised. Yeah. You might be surprised. I think what we're doing again is we go back to we start to make assumptions. We start to make assumptions about what we think people might want or what they might not want. And again, would my grandpa have given me a buck saw? No. 
right? Margaret, you had a question? I was just say, don't make the assumptions. Uh -huh. We found there are five of us. We did the numbers. So it right. Was, but it was, we all realized it was just stuff. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, everything had been appraised. And it wasn't people choosing what was of higher value. It was they remembered the stories. Yep. They remembered something that was always on the table or you know, the doorstop or the cookie tin. Floor. Or the dog with the head that wags. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it That's was, right. And in the end, those were the stories. So it was that process of sharing. And Your children may have a higher value in those plates if they know that they're, would it be their grandfather ate off of them? Their great-grandfather. Their great-grandfather ate right. off of them. Children. That's right. I wouldn't like that mirror in my mom's dining room if I didn't know where it came from. And, and that reminds me, too, um, again, when my grandparents passed away, my mom and her siblings remembered a lot of the gifts that us grandchildren had given them, and we got those back. And that's very special. So that might be something that you want to think about in that distribution process. So again, we need to think about what is our yellow pie plate? Why is it important to you? Who do you want to have it? Most importantly, have you asked them if they want it? And then finally, when do you plan to give these things? And what's the best time to give these things? Right now, as far as I'm concerned. Right now. Yeah. yeah, some people are saying yesterday. <laughs> you know, we want to do this while we're alive, folks. Um, a lot of those special items, they can, uh, you can share the stories about some of those items. And some people say to me, but Jan, I want to enjoy them while I'm alive. Well, you can. You still can. But there, is, there does come a time when you need to think about that transfer point, which can be a really special time. I had a woman in a workshop. She was um, a great-grandmother. And she had made these binders filled with pictures and stories and, and all kinds of wonderful items that she gave each one of her great-grandchildren. Um, and of course, some of them were, were too young to really appreciate it, even less than a year old. But at the same time, those binders were done. And no matter what happened to her today or tomorrow or the next day, um, those things were going to be transferred uh, to her great-grandchildren. And that, I think, is one of the best gifts that can be given. So again, I would challenge you, think about what your pie plate is and, uh, and what you're going to do with that. And have you asked them if they want it? I think that's really, really important. Now, I've got some handouts here. I do want to call your attention to some of the worksheets. Um, in, in one set of your handouts, there's worksheet A and worksheet B. Now, Worksheet A is actually, actually for the owners or the givers of the property to identify special objects to transfer. So if you've got some things that you, that you have that you say, OK, this is special, and I want to make sure that this goes somewhere, you, this, you start to, to write this stuff down. This is not the official list that you would refer to in the will. This is a discussion starter, OK? This is a, um, a great thing to do right before holidays, for example. You start to make a list of these things. My mom did. She made a list of some of the, the antiques and the family heirlooms um, that, that us children were going to have to start talking about. Then you say why this item's special and maybe who should receive it. Hopefully, you've talked to them. But the next worksheet, I think, is really valuable. This is for the children or other potential receivers to identify special objects that they want to receive. Okay? Now, you can describe the item that you want, why it's special. And then the third column, some people are blocking out. <laughs> it says, if someone else received this item, I would feel. So some parents are actually blocking that off. Some are leaving it on. It doesn't matter. You can do what you want. These are photocopyable. Okay? You, can, you can photocopy as many as you want. But this, you might want to give out at family um, uh, holiday dinners or get-togethers. And you might want to say, start thinking about some of these items that are really special to you, whether it's a quilt or it's a dining room table or whether it's a, um, a dog with a head that wagged or whatever it is. But you start to think about those items. And I guarantee you, you're going to be surprised by some of this stuff. <laughs> um, because sometimes we, we identify with those objects that, that we remember. In a, a video that I sometimes show with this, there's a woman who's talking about um, this, uh, this other woman who was surprised by the fact that her son wants the toaster that has been in the family for over 40 years. It still works. They still use it in the morning, but this son has special memories attached to that toaster. So uh, there's a lot of surprises when you do things like this, which can be really fun. But Worksheet B, again, is a discussion starter. It's not the official list that you would refer to in the will. 
but it's a way to get families to start talking with one another. So I would encourage you to use those. And remember, too, um, that transfer decisions are frequently made at transition points. You can do these when you're moving from a house into a, an apartment or into a long-term care facility. Um, another time when these decisions are made, unfortunately, is after the death. And that is not the preferred way to do this. So you want to try to, try, to, um, try to talk about these things while people are alive. Because we're going to talk about some distribution methods here. You can do some pre-planning. Okay? And if you do pre-planning, there's more things that you can do. You can ask family members what they want. <laughs> what a novel thought, right? Ask them what they want. You can label items. You can make lists. You can put wishes in a will. You can give items away. Um, gift them, okay, and uh, verbal promises. Now, I would, I would caution you against verbal promises. Aunt Annie promised the round oak table to Johnny. Aunt Annie promised the round oak table to Susie. Aunt Annie promised the round oak table to Jan. She didn't do it on purpose, folks. She didn't do it on purpose, but it happened, and there was a lot of family hostility related to that. So be really careful of verbal promises. After the death, um, there are fewer options. You can distribute among the family, sell things at sales and auctions, donate to charity, throw things away. Um, you, need to, you need to think about talking about these things while you're alive. And again, I would, I, would, I would encourage you, include a lot of people in this distribution discussion and process. Uh, the property owner, the personal representatives or executors, children, grandchildren, relatives, um, in-laws, Again, this is your choice. Friends, significant others, spouses. I would add neighbors to that. Um, don't forget about the fact that there's some very special neighbors, even uh, ministers or priests, a lot of special people in our lives that we may want to include in this process. Caregivers, attorneys, mediators. Um, we need to, uh, we need to um, make sure that we include all the people that we need to in this. Now, just from a more of a legal standpoint, I am not a lawyer. But I did check with a lawyer in Iowa and made sure that we had Iowa code in here. Um, decisions, this is Iowa code 633-276. Uh, uh, decisions about the transfer of personal property may be addressed in a written statement, letter, or list, not otherwise dis uh, specifically disposed of in the will. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, but we, what, I guess the point that I want to make here is that if you move from Iowa to another state, you want to make sure that you transfer personal property according to those, those state laws because every state may be different. Now, as an example of this, which I don't want to go into the legal, uh, legalese here, but basically what you want, the writing, this is the list that you make, must be referred to in the will. Now, I have a question for you. If you don't refer to that list in the will, is it legally binding? The answer is no. So I had a person in a workshop say, Jan, I'm not going to refer to that list in the will, and then it won't be part of my estate, correct? Correct. However, I've heard horror stories, folks, of where people come in, and it could be a family member, during the funeral, for example, take everything, and there's no legal recourse. All right. So you really want to be careful. I strongly encourage you to talk to a lawyer about this. It's a very good idea to make this list and refer to it in the will so that it is legally binding. All right. It doesn't have to be part of the will, per se, but it has to be referred to in the will. It must be in the handwriting of the person making the will. Uh, must be signed, dated. Must describe the items with reasonable certainty and describe who's going to get the items with reasonable certainty. And here's an example. And I think I have this in a set of your handouts. I hope I do. Here's an example of the list that you might want to make. And look up at the corner, uh, right-hand corner. It says page blank of blank. Let's say that you have five pages, okay? Five pages of lists. You want to say page one of five, two of five, three of five, four of five, and five of five so that you don't lose some of those pages at the end. Very, very good tip here. Then you say to my fa family, heirs, executor, or personal representative, this is the list that I refer to in my last will and testament. Therefore, please distribute the items listed below to the persons I have named. And you start listing those things. And who's going to get them? List them in detail. Now, the first one there says grandfather's clock from living room. They don't walk. But you might want to describe it a little bit more than that. Who's going to get it? It's my sister, Susan Anderson Jones. Be very, very specific 
with full names on this. And then just go through, make a list. It could be several pages long. It must be dated, must be signed, and it would be a good idea to notarize it. Okay? Then you refer to this list in the will and the date that you've dated it. Then it is legally binding. Okay? But what do you do before you make the list? Ask them if they want it. Good. Don't make assumptions. Okay. Excellent. Any questions on that? Okay. A um, couple things in closing. Um, remember that there are several options for distribution. Okay? Several options. Wills. Good one. Making lists. Good one. Gifting items. Good one. How about verbal or someday promises? Good idea? No. It's a distribution option, but it's not a good one, folks. Okay? Masking tape. How many, don't, don't raise your hands. <laughs> I know a lot of families, though, that have used masking tape as a distribution option. They'll, they'll put a, a thing of masking tape on something that they want someone to get, and they'll put that person's name on it. Now, I have a question for you. Is masking tape permanent? Could it be taken off one item and put on another? Get the, get the, get the hint here? <laughs> not a good idea. It's a distribution option, but it's not a good one. Also, when you write on masking tape, a lot of times it fades. So keep that in mind. Private auctions within the family, uh, silent auctions. By the way, there was something in that videotape that I mentioned that's really cool. Some families, if they don't want to actually exchange money for, sing for things, sometimes what they're doing is they're, they're giving out uh, play money or monopoly money to all the family members. You can bid on certain items using the play money. So if you put all your monopoly money on one thing, that sends a message that that's really, really important to you, okay? So that may be one thing that you want to try. Um, there's public auctions, garage sales, estate sales. What's pilfering? What does pilfering mean? Stealing. Stealing. Cousin Susie came to visit. Something's missing. Cousin Susie came, you know, another time. Something's missing again. Pilfering is a distribution option, but it's not a very good one, okay? Keep that in mind. Then there's family distribution, remover of leftover property. Um, when, again, when my grandparents died, mom and her siblings went into the house and they chose things with the one, two, three, four, two, three, four, whatever system. Then they brought in all of us grandchildren at a later date and we all chose certain items. We did that twice. Then mom had several garage sales and then she ended up throwing some things away. Lots of distribu distribution methods with, the, with that one household. And sometimes it takes a while to do that. So keep that in mind as you go through that. Uh, intestate means dying without a will. It's a distribution method, but it's not a good one from a tax standpoint. Okay. So remember those. Um, also remember that there are several sources of conflict out there. Okay. These, I'm sure, are not in any of your families. Lack of communication, misunderstood intentions, making inaccurate assumptions, uh, power and control issues, envy, jealousy, greed, selfishness, inability to compromise. Now, I always ask in my workshops, are there families that have had absolutely no conflict? And, and always there are a few that raise their hand, and that is great. But I tell you what, they're in the minority, folks. They're in the minority. To keep in mind, too, that the conflict could lead to a positive discussion. Okay, it could lead to some of those discussions of, wow, I didn't know that you had that experience with that person or that you um, used to go stay with that person and you had those good, good things happen. So sometimes there's some of those things that could come out of that discussion which could be really, really good and useful in the family. In closing, remember, there is no one perfect method of transfer. Okay, you got to do this within your family, what's right for your family situation. Seek creative solutions. Monopoly money, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, three, four, one, two, four, one, two, three. Stay focused on your goals. Remember the goals that we talked about, either maintaining privacy or, or improving family relationships or, or donating to, um, to the community. Remember, too, that there are more transfer options available when you plan prior to your death as opposed to when you wait until after you die, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, also, each method of transfer has different consequences. And finally, remember to transfer according to state law. If you move out of Iowa, there could be totally different laws involved in this. So make sure that you check that out. And I'll leave you with one final thought. 
You never really know a person until you share an inheritance with them. How true is that? <laughs> Sometimes those true colors really come through here. Um, so again, what we're trying to do is get families to talk with one another and communicate, not make assumptions. Ask people if they want things. And I think if we start to do that and we hand out those lists that I gave you, those, those charts, those worksheets, maybe that will get the discussion started in those families where it's a little hard to start that. You know, one sibling may want to start it, but it, they're, they're afraid that the other sibling may, may uh, not feel comfortable with that. So sometimes those, those worksheets are a good place to start. I would also tell you that um, we do have a workbook available if you wish to purchase it. Um, it is available at cost through Minnesota Extension, and I have it up here if anybody wants to see it. Um, a lot of your handouts, or your handouts have a lot of those um, uh, charts and graphs already in them. But this is an extra if you, if you want it. Are there any questions? Any, uh, any good stories? Not so good stories? I don't have stories, but um, my question you're talking about people who have families, mm. you know, children. And what, do you, what if you don't have children? What? And the you really don't have nieces and nephews that you would like to give your things. Good to. question. The question is what if you don't have? the immediate family or even the nieces and nephews to give things to, um, a lot of people um, are thinking about the neighbors, the really good friends, uh, the people in their, in their churches or religious affiliations, um, donating to the historical society or the local museums. Um, there, are, there are special people in, our, people in our lives that may not be immediate family. And um, we need to think about those people. And we also need to think about people that may not have a lot of things. So there may be organizations in our community that we want to target and say, hey, you know, I have some of these things and, and I would want to um, gift these things uh, upon my death or when I transfer into another facility, whatever it is. And a lot of those organizations are, are very grateful for some of those, those things. So keep that in mind, too. Well, yeah, you can go and talk to them, actually. I know several organizations locally, and I can talk to you afterwards, um, that, um, that do have those things available for people in need, which would be a wonderful, wonderful gift to give. Another situation, before I think about it, there are a lot of families out there with blended family situations. And you've got the stepchildren and the stepparents, and oh my gosh, there's a ton of situations out there that could be very, very difficult, which is another good reason to start that communication to make sure that the step, step, step <laughs> doesn't end up with, with all the original things from a family. Um, so you need to be careful. Do you have a well, question? I was going to say, if you uh, didn't have children and needed to find some place, you could have an auction with mm -hmm. the proceeds going to the charity. Perfect. Choice. If you, again, don't have a family situation, have an auction and have the proceeds go to a particular uh, a charity that you choose in advance, um, which is, which is a, an excellent way to do that. Exactly. Good comments. Anything else? Well, you know, I've seen a couple, in a couple of instances where people have left monies or money to, um, well, one I'm thinking about is the cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, upkeep project for a gate and a fence and the upkeep of the grounds and um, money and you know they're long gone they've been gone for a hundred years you know and there's an administrator set up to take care of this and as the years go on it's kind of forgotten what these funds were really intended to be way back when and they get some new administrator who's not really you know making sure that things are taken care of like the original person really wanted mm -hmm. Put your wishes in writing. I mean, they are in writing. But over the years, it's yeah, uh, that that gets very difficult. Um, you know, if you've got family no or left around to do anything about it. yeah, well, I was going to say if there's family or friends that can make sure that that contact continues to be made. But boy, you'd hope that if you do give money to a to a, an organization like that or to a local cemetery that they would have a special place to keep those things and maybe that's what you do when you give them in, in, uh, at first when you give those things may, I, I want to make sure that this stays wh where is this going to be kept and how am I going to make sure that, that, that this happens and if they can't assure you <laughs> I think I think twice so that's a, that's a, that's a good thought but see I think probably the people who were there in the beginning was, would make that insurance yeah. it's as the years things go change. by 
right. you know, 50, 75 years later, and all those original people are gone, yeah. things kind of get lost. Yeah. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what you're doing. Anybody have a suggestion? <clears throat> no, I was just uh -huh. trying to say that one aspect of that is that a gift is a gift situation. If, if we gave something to the Johnson County Historical Society, and the next director decided it was taking up too much space, mm. it could go. If you Margaret? Give a book to the <laughs> do that. Make sure that doesn't happen, Margaret. No, it, well, it can't. No. The process is such, and, well, you didn't finish. No, well, I was going to say you give a book to the library, mm -hmm. and pretty soon it's weeded out. So I, yeah. I don't think that it's possible to make sure. It's hard. And, and yeah. we're doing this in Iowa City, you only need to know about Hickory Hill to know. <laughs> Yeah, no really. Bad. That's true. That's true. Yeah, there's no, there's no assurances, but you can certainly think about what you really want, put your wishes in writing, and hope that that's really going to be carried out, and, and, uh, and do it with a clean heart. Um, I would just clarify on, <laughs> when I leave, I'm <laughs> next year, no, uh, there are safeguard checks and balances in on that when something, in the case of being given to Johnson County Historical Society, I do not have the authority <laughs> to, to throw something away or de you know what we call mm -hmm. deaccessioning. There's a process, but if it belongs in the collection, you know that is not something that's taken lightly mm -hmm. at all. And so we appreciate that. You can rest assured. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just want to say two things. Having just gone through this, I can't reiterate enough the importance of the story behind items. Mm -hmm. um, that is just so valuable and makes an object even more priceless mm -hmm. uh, besides any monetary is, is knowing that story of, of a little picture that somebody brought milk every day. You mm -hmm. know? And the other thing is no verbal agreements because right. uh, we discovered my mother had told different people, unfortunately I was not one of them <laughs> and I didn't get it, but was discovered you know, that she had given things while she was alive, but she had told Several three people. different people. That, and, and that does cause hurt. So the more you can make things clear or give ahead of time, it really does help the family stay together. You know, there's always going to be some hurt because of that. Excellent points. Anything else? Yes. Well, that happened to me twice. Uh, my great aunt had, had a tea set that had a hand-painted violet sign. And she gave it to someone else. But that didn't bother me because I thought, well, she wanted me to have it at that time. She thought of me. And uh, I was just as good as having it. Yeah. And the same thing, my aunt left me a, a, a ring in her will. And the lawyer called me after she died and said they couldn't find it. So I thought, well, she wanted me to have it. I didn't, I didn't oh, need it. You have a great attitude. <laughs> well, if it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, there's another thing. My mother, when she was 18, received a diamond ring from her father. And it, when I was 18, well, actually, the Christmas before I was 18, she gave it to me. And so my daughter got it on her 18th birthday. Aww. But I had no idea who's going to get it after my daughter because she doesn't have any children. Maybe a niece. Yeah, it could be moms. There's a lot of special people in our lives, even if it isn't a direct blood relative. So we need to think about that. Yes? Uh, <coughs> One thing that um, I, I'm uncertain about on, on the list that is referred to in the will, mm -hmm. uh, the signed and dated, uh, does this mean you have to modify your will every time you make a new list? You don't have to modify the will. Um, um, you might have to modify the date that's in there of the list. You can modify the list anytime you want, okay? Um, but yes, when you modify that list, you have to redate it. So there would be. There would be, I guess, something that you need to do, and call, contact your attorney. Hopefully, they'll do that for, you know, very little, if the anything. The assumption is that the list is made before your will is made, but that, that may not be too. No, even after idea. your will is made, you may be modifying that list given changing family search situations. Hopefully, you're not going to modify that list every week. Okay? You get mad at Susie, and you're going to modify the list. You get mad at Johnny the next week. Hopefully, that's not going to happen. Um, but. There, there are changing family situations, and we need to, to make sure that we take account for that. You said about adding things to it. Adding things to the list? Yeah. You can do that. You can, the list is in your possession, whereas the will is the legal document. So you'd want to modify the list in your possession, redate it, and make sure that that 
updated date is, is, is mentioned in your will. And talk to your attorney about how to do that the easiest way. So. Good questions. Anything else? I'd be more apt to make a list and say, you have to take this <laughs> and keep it in the family. <laughs> you can't make it <laughs> Yeah, no guarantees there. But uh, again, again, we need to, to, to ask people if they want things, and they're a lot more likely to keep them if we do that. Yes? Yeah, another thing that you sort of suggested or hinted at mm -hmm. is that, um, let's say you have two or three children, and one of them only has an apartment, mm -hmm. or you know that next year they're going to be moving to Florida to mm -hmm. have a job there. And so the, it, it might not be possible to give a, a descendant mm -hmm. uh, an object that they there then are not going to be able to take care of. That's right. Just because of their circumstances. And that happened to me. Um, from my great-grandmother, I got a sugar and creamer that came over from Germany. But I, at that time, was in school moving every single year. And my mother kept it for me in that round glass china closet. <laughs> and so um, when, I, when I did finally settle down, um, I got that. So uh, you, can, you can have lots of circumstances like that. Good point. But you have to find somebody willing to keep it. Mm hmm Yeah. And we're waiting for our grandchildren to marry and settle down. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening fast enough, huh? Oh, oh boy. You. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Um, uh, I, I hope you've... I hope you've enjoyed the program and and uh, got a lot out of it. Yeah, there are a lot of things to think about with this with this particular issue. So, thanks very much.